Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert. I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. This is a pretty fun episode, but I have to apologize up front. I had some issues with my microphone, which I didn't realize until uh, after the interview was completed, uh, listening to the playback. So unfortunately, my audio quality isn't that great. It's a little tinny, and I apologize for that. Uh, I did get a new uh, cable for the microphone, which was the problem, and hopefully it sounds a lot better now than it did. This interview is a lot of fun. I got to interview... An old friend, Peter Bilo. Peter is a uh, very active antique telescope collector. He has quite the collection and has some really incredible instruments. He's also a board member at the AAVSO, which is the American Association of Variable Star Observers. Quite the organization. They do a lot. Peter has done quite a lot. Uh, so it's very interesting, and I'm sure that you'll enjoy it as much, or if not more than I did. So sit back and enjoy. So... Uh, it's my pleasure to have a, an old friend, Peter Bilo, with us uh, on the podcast. Peter uh, and I go back probably over 20 years, right, Peter? I would guess that. I would I guess remember. that. So I've been attending cellophane since the mid-70s. Okay. Um, other than the year cellophane was shut down, um, I missed three. Wow. Uh, you got a beat. I missed, uh, I don't know, probably about seven or eight since... Uh, I think 19, 1981 was my first convention. And I think I missed probably, yeah, seven or eight years. And, and, and I'm not even a member. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting you mentioned cellophane. That's actually something I'll be doing an episode on uh, probably later in the spring. So uh, like I said, we go back a long way. Uh, I remember uh, doing the horseshoe pitching contest, doing that back in the 1990s. Uh, when I first met your kids and, you know, now they're adults and married and, uh, you know, out on their own, uh, which is fantastic. And, and although my daughter still thinks that, that your daughter is six. So, <laughs> so Anna is now 30. Wow. So Anna um, and Liz are the same age. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, my son, Nick is 26. Wow. Uh, Anna won the very first uh, horseshoe pitching contest. <laughs> And at that time, Steve didn't bring a kit. So he basically took her around the swap tables and scrounged parts. And we have something that's kind of like a telescope in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is so generous uh, with that. And he, he was on here. He came on about a year ago. And we did uh, an episode about beginners and, and tools for beginners to use when they're starting a hobby. But uh, what, so some of the questions that I always like to ask guests are, uh, when did you first get interested in astronomy as a hobby? So when I was a kid, probably 10 or 11 years old, I had, I did a lot of reading and, and, and some of it was, you know, elementary science stuff. And um, I grew up in Binghamton, New York. Uh, which is in the southern tier. It's like halfway across the state, right on the Pennsylvania border. And Binghamton has a small uh, museum called Robertson Center for the Arts and Sciences, and they had a planetarium. Uh, and every now and again, the astronomy club there would hold star parties. And my dad saw, you know, he knew I was interested in kind of science stuff. And they were going to have a star party uh, to show off Saturn uh, at Robertson Center, and he took me. And my very now, I, I was. Uh, I, th this is kind of a heady start. My very first view through a telescope was through a four-inch unitron with a weight drive wow. of Saturn, and it just knocked my socks off. Um, you know did, did that start the fire in you about fast yeah, granting yeah. telescopes. Yep. And, and it turned out they had an astronomy club, and the astronomy club had a junior section. So, so I joined that within a couple months. So I've, I've belonged to some astronomy club or another since I was like 12 or 13 years old. 
And um, the adults were really good people. Um, I'm still in touch with a couple of them. Uh, and they didn't treat us like little kids. You know, we were like junior humans, but but still, they treated us reasonably, you know. And um, and um, my mentor, uh, I still consider him my mentor, is uh, still alive in Kitten, Rich DeLuca, who was, uh, ran the planetarium down there. Um, back in um, the late 70s, Rich, um, through a huge effort, had an observatory made. Uh, it's now called the Copernic Center. Um, <clears throat> the club changed its name to the Copernic Society Dolls. But Rich had a, a nice two-domed observatory built. And uh, again, he's still uh, he's still around. Uh, he has a, a few telescopes. We talk every now and again. It was uh, really good times. Um, I was fortunate enough that uh, Binghamton was only about half an hour or so from Cander, New York. In Cander, New York is where Vernon Scope was. So, um, and Don, uh, Don Yair, the owner, treated us kids pretty well. Uh, we could show up, you know, with parents obviously driving us, and he'd sell us cosmetic seconds for, for next to nothing. So we never had to use those crappy Edmund Ramsden's and all that. We we all had we all had uh, Brandon I uh, Brandon IP sets that cost us nothing. So when it comes to observing, uh, what type of objects do you like to to observe the most? I, I'd say I'm primarily a planetary observer. Um, I like the gas giants, um, and I think my, my telescope array is kind of aim towards that. Um, so I have a problem like, like many in the hobby do. Uh, I'm a hoarder. Okay. I have more telescopes than, than, uh, Carter's got little liver pills, as they say. Um, um, these days I say I do most observing on my, I have a, a, a year and a half ago, I picked up a five inch, uh, Brandon refractor. So it's five inch F8 Apo, uh, with a rolling Kristen lens in it. And uh, I, I love that telescope. Now, I have a six-inch astrophysics F9 as well. But to be perfectly honest, is the, they're, they're pretty close in performance. And it's it, now that I'm in my 60s, it's a, it's a pain to put that six-inch tube assembly on. It gets me nervous trying to put it up on that mount, German Equatorial, whereas the five inches uh, well, well within my range. Big scopes are a little scary. Like that, I know you've got, uh, which kind of leads me in, into a, an offshoot question here, but I know you're interested in antique telescopes and you've got uh, some very, very cool uh, instruments. Do you want to tell us a little bit about some of that? Sure. Um, you know, along the way, I've picked up a, I have a four inch, um, like a 15 ish uh, Elvin Clark on a German Equatorial. Uh, I've got a three and a half inch uh, Mogi. Um, you know, from Plainfield, New Jersey. Um, um, and I have, and I'll, I'll show a picture of this later. I've got a, a pair of four inch F15 Brashear refractors on a common equatorial mount. One of the, one of the pair is corrected, has a lens corrected for visual use. The other's corrected for photographic use. I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, but that's still, that's still a work in progress. <laughs> Um, but the, the thing that got me going, I'd say in classics, okay, I read, I read a lot and I digest and think about what I read. Okay. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't do that way. And about, uh, sometime in the, when the heck was this late nineties, there was a, a press release in Sky and Telescope from a company called Taurus Instruments. And Taurus was uh, announced that they were, they got the contract to build the replacement telescope for Queens College in Kingston, Ontario. And I'm the only person I believe who looked at that press release and said, what's it replacing? So the internet was relatively new, but Queens College had a, a website and um, they had a 15 and a half inch Fecker Cassegrain. Fecker is a successor to Brashear. So I um, 
I, I also like, I don't mind writing emails to people and I'm not good with the word no. Um, you find ways around no. You as a realtor know that. Um, so I wrote a, I found out who the head of the astronomy department was, wrote him a nice email congratulating him on getting the funding for a new scope. And I know how difficult it is. And then, oh, by the way, what are you doing with the old one? And he, his response was, <clears throat> we're going to throw away all the metal and we're going to give the glass, uh, the, the optics to the local astronomy club, the local RASC group. So I responded to that with, well, I'm kind of interested in classic telescopes. How about if I donated an equal size set of glass to the RASC group and let me take the whole 15 inch becker you have. So their response was basically, nah, yeah, no, you could just buy it from us. <laughs> and it, then it, they said, make an offer. And it was like, it was excruciating coming up with an offer that was high enough not to be insulting, but yet as low as possible. Okay. Right, I get that. So, so I came up with an offer and they snapped it right up. And, um, over the course of a week, one weekend, Ken Lawney, you know Ken Lawney, I believe. Yes, absolutely. Ken, um, uh, Kevin McCarthy, another AtMob member, and uh, a guy named Steve Beckwith, who used to be an AtMob. We took our two uh, Ford SUVs. We drove up Friday night after work, got there at like two in the morning, slept until eight, and we spent about six hours, seven hours pulling the thing apart and filling up our two SUVs with this telescope and then brought it back to the U S and got home by Sunday night. Amazing. It was, it was different. Coming across the border was interesting. So <laughs> I, I'm the lead car. We pull up to customs and the guy is, do you have anything to declare? Well, yeah, <laughs> I've got this big telescope. Part of it's in this car and part of it's in the car and back of me. So he's like, well, yeah, you better come in with that. <laughs> but I, these guys, the, 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 the university had kept the paperwork that showed that it originated in Pittsburgh. And it was bought from the U.S., so I didn't owe any duty. Oh. They just let us through. Wow. That's fantastic. Now, I know that you've got one of the rarest telescopes out there, which is a Porter <laughs> Garden Telescope. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how you came, and, came about it? And I'm looking at it right now. It's across the room from me. Uh, sure. So um, we're not wealthy people, but my wife and I, when working, we're both professionals, working professionals, engineering type. So we had a little bit of disposable income. I had bought a few small $100, $200 items through Skinner Auctions. Skinner used to be an auction house in Boston. I think they've been bought by somebody some other larger house so in the mail mail comes there's a skinner catalog in it and i open you know take open the envelope and there on the front cover is a porter garden telescope so rachel's had been to stella fane she knows about russell and and she'd seen a garden telescope and all so i just offhanded showed it to her saying oh geez look at this skinner has a um a garden telescope they're going to auction off and she said well how much is it going to go for and i said I gave her the number. I was pretty close. And she goes, well, do you want it? And it's like, well, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but and she goes, well, will it appreciate in value? And I said, absolutely. So she said, get it. Just don't root it once you get it. <clears throat> so that's about it. So I acquired a garden telescope. And, and I, I believe it, given what uh, Vermont telescopes charges for their knockoffs, um, I suspect uh, I will do okay if, someday when I resell this. Hopefully you paid less than uh, Vermont Telescope. Um, actually, this was the last public sale of a garden telescope, and Roger Sinnott wrote an article and put it in Skytel. So it's public. I, I, I paid 18000 plus uh, yeah, a commission for it. They're, they're really beautiful. And uh, how many of those, what, 30-something of them made? Um, at least 53. Uh, and, and we know that because each of them has a serial number and mine has the highest serial number. No. Uh, Bert Willard 
has uh, like a catalog of, of known garden telescopes, um, which he's kind enough to share with with owners. So we kind of all know who has what and what bits and pieces. And, yeah. and that started off, that started me off on Porter. So I also have a few paintings by Russell Porter and um, a drawing that's in um, ATM book one. I have the one an original drawing of somebody looking through a Springfield telescope. So again, I tend to read and I tend to process what I read. So I'm looking at an eBay auction one day, and they for copper printing plates, and it, it was really vague. Didn't say very much, but it was like twenty some copper printing plates. And I look at the one that they had an image of, and I'm going, "That's familiar. That's really familiar." So I grab my copy of ATM book one. And what it was, was the drawing of the focal test of a parabolic mirror. And when I looked really carefully in the corner, I could see the reversed RWP. So I bid like $25 for 25 uh, copper plates. And then the next day I went back and said, someone's going to outbid me. These Stella fame guys are going to see this. So I upped the bid each day of the auction. I upped my maximum bid, but no one else figured out what the heck this stuff was. And I got all 25 of these for 25 bucks. Wow. Um, I actually had the opportunity to go to an antique roadshow event here in Boston. And I, I took it into their book guy. Um, what's his name? Ken Glass, I think it is. He owns a Brattle Street bookstore. And and a decade ago, he he thought they were, they'd be worth about 100 bucks each. I think I think it's he doesn't know the AT the amateur astronomy world. I think he's shy on those. But what I'd like to do is actually use them in print. I keep talking about doing this, but I haven't. Like print like note cards or calendars. Okay? Um and use that as a fundraiser for somebody, you know, anti telescope society or STMs or whoever. Um I talked about doing it a while back, but one STM member gave me a lot of grief about violating copyright. So uh, I kind of set that aside. Yeah. And it's really cool. Like, so in ATM book one, there's a set of drawings of porters on different forms of telescope mounts where he starts off with a drawing of a surveyor, uh, a transit, and then he, he tilts it to make it equatorial. And then he makes a, a German equatorial and a, a yoke. And a, just a, I have all those copper plates for those drawings. Oh, and, you know, and, and the, the people who had them, by the way, was a metal recycling place in Newark, New Jersey. The pub, the publisher had sold them the, the all their copper printing plates. And then these guys were trying to see if there was a market for any of them before they melted them. That's amazing. That's uh, what a great find. So um, it, and, and by the way, the, so the, these are these are clearly going to, you know, end up in Vermont. Right. Um, one of the neat things is, like I mentioned, I have this drawing, a Porter drawing that ended up in the book. I have the copper printing plate from the drawing. Wow. And I have them mounted together. That's yeah. Really, I mean, really spectacular stuff. Now, right. uh, you know, um, I need, I need to thank the Springfield telescope makers. Um, I had had those plates for a few years when the drawing came uh, available at an auction house and I reached out and, and people like Matt and Bert, you know, knew I had these things. And I reached out to them both. And I said, guys, let me get the drawing. Don't bid against me. I'm going to put it together with the copper printing plate, mount it all up. And at some point in the future, it's, it's heading up your way at no cost. I, I remember uh, that going around the STM bus and, and the people you're referring to, Matt Constantine and, and Bert Willard. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful. I mean, it, it was the only way to easily get them together quickly. You know, otherwise you'd have to wait until I'm like almost dead, which could be tomorrow, <laughs> but it could be 30 years from now, you know, before it ends up there. Well, let's hope it's the latter. Well, we're we're kind of hoping. So, uh, besides astronomy, and, and I know we're going to dive into what you're, something you're really passionate about but do you have other science interests as well I and mean, it sounds like you do geez what's he talking about um do i have other science interests yeah i have a um 
I've, I've been I've known about like AVSO, the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers. You know, since I was a kid. You know, they're in the sky and tell and all this, but I never really took the time to do anything with it or join up. <clears throat> and every year I go to Stella Fane and and even between Stella Fanes, I go to Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston meetings and Mario Mata would be there pushing AAVSO membership and the cool things we do and all this. I, I frankly I didn't have a lot of time as, you know, growing up, we were raising a couple of kids and all that. But um, at the start of COVID, it was like I was retired already. I somehow I noticed again. I read things and I noticed. And AABSO has classes on various aspects of observing and data analysis. And because of COVID, they were offering the courses for free, just to give people something to do. So I started taking classes, and I ended up taking a class on how to how to um, image exoplanets and analyze exoplanet transit data. Uh, another one on analyzing um, CCD or uh, CMOS images for variable stars, a couple things like that. And it's like, I took a couple of them for free. And it's like, you know, there's, I really need to join this group. You know, they're providing good stuff. They're doing good things for the, for the astronomy community. And I have time and I've just used some of their resources. So I owe them. So I ended up joining AAVSO. Um, I've known some mem members for a long time, anyhow. Um, and as soon as I, I joined, I noted that AAVSO has a network of telescopes around the world that I can get data from. I just have to put a, a single page proposal together. And if they're not doing data on a, for a, or imaging for, of a particular star for someone else, they'll say they put you in. So I started putting proposals in. And uh, I've had like 12 of them accepted. And over the last three years, I've submitted about 15,500 observations to their database. That's and awesome. and about half of them are, are, are data on stars that no one else observes. And I guess the way I do that is like, I'm looking at your background there. There's a ton of stars in the background. Well, you know, we, so I get an image with a ton of stars and only one's the target star that I'm really looking for. Like I could do an analysis and like, oh, look, there's 12 other variable stars in the field and I'm getting good signal to noise ratio on them. So they're, it's adequately exposed. I might as well submit data on all of them. Because if you're, if you're gonna go through the process of doing one, it takes no more effort to do a dozen or 20. Right. And then I started looking at, you know, the stars that I was reporting on. It's like, oh, no one's reported on this star in 10 years. You know, somebody, you know, did back in 1980 for some reason. Well, you know, so we're just, you know, filling in the data. Uh, so we've been doing that. And then I'm also a big believer, Wayne, in kind of giving back. You know, so I was I've been I was taking a lot of data somewhere around the 8000 or 9000 data point region um i saw that um uh the the people who run the network of telescopes were looking for someone to review the images off of one of the network telescopes basically is a like a you know when the images come down take a look at all of them just like point out it's like oh my god there's an issue <laughs> kind of thing and, and it was like yeah why not so now like two or three days a week i get 50 or 100 images um, just to scroll through quickly from a from a twenty four inch uh, Casa Grande down in the the Texas Hill Country, um, and uh, just just to review and you know point out if there's any issues. And there have and there haven't been. So I, I started doing that, and then also um, um, I, I was contacted about whether I'd be interested in running for the board. There's their, their board of directors. Um, basically, they have three slots every year that, that are open for the board. And they, they find six people to run. And I thought, yeah, sure, put my name in the hat. Nobody knows me, but you need six. So what the heck, right? Son of a gun, I won one of the slots this year. <laughs> so, so I mean, AVSO is kind of a, I'll call it a real organization. There's five staff members. Uh, we have a budget of about a million dollars a year. Um, 
you know, so it's um, a reasonably sized uh, nonprofit. And I'm learning. I've only been on the board a, a month and a half, but uh, I know most most of the member board members now, and they're all quite interesting people. And and one of our uh, uh, friends is uh, Dr. Chris Larson, who is a past yes. president of the AAVSL. Indeed, indeed. And I know she's uh, told me she will come on here. Uh, we just haven't been able to sync up our times to to make that happen, but she'll come on and talk about some of her research or. I'd love to have her talk about the AAVSL, but she's a, a very accomplished uh, astronomy professor at uh, Central Connecticut State University. But yep. I think we're kind of leaning into what your your uh, presentation really is about. So why don't I let you just go right into it? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so let me. This uh, is just a shot of my backyard observatory. Uh, I have a I have a twelve by sixteen foot uh, roll off uh, observatory. Usually have two telescopes mounted in it. Uh, this is back quite a way a while back because we still had a, a you know swings and uh, and such in the uh, uh, the backyard as well. Now that the kids are 26 and 30, uh, yeah, we don't have that anymore. And I mentioned uh, the telescope I got from Queens University, Queen uh, up in Kingston. This is a picture of it in its dome. Uh, weighs give or take windage, it weighs about a thousand pounds. Uh, we had one day to disassemble it, take it out of the observatory, put it into cars and then get home. Uh, it was interesting pulling this thing down. The fork is welded uh, welded uh, steel and the fork alone weighed about 300 pounds. And we had to lower it down through a, um, like a ship's, down like a ship's ladder. Right? The, to get up the observatory was almost a vertical ladder to climb into it. And all we had was, um, all we had was closed, clothesline rope, you know, really weak stuff. So we had like four or five, you know, pieces of rope on it, lowering it down. And this undergraduate student jumps underneath it and yells, if it breaks, I'll catch it. <laughs> like, no, it'll kill you. And you now that's the group of us who, uh, who brought the, got the telescope out, Steve Beckworth, Kevin McCarthy and, uh, and Ken Lowney and the rest of them are, university people up there. Nice folks, kept it in great shape. When I had it set up in the observatory, it looked like this, um, kind of took up my whole observatory. Uh, I have since pulled it down and I've repainted the whole thing and relubed it and all, but I haven't put it up because it takes my whole observatory. And I'd rather have two systems in it. So to be honest, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do with it at this point. So the next thing I, I wandered into telescope wise is on some auction or another, there were a whole bunch of three and a half by, I think there were three and a half by four or four and a half inch glass plate negatives. And they were, um, and I ended up over the course of a few years buying hundreds of them, okay, for, for next to nothing. It didn't cost me anything. I spent 50 or 100 bucks. And there were pictures of this telescope. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, two telescope, you know, OTAs. Um, here's a, this is a plate holder, obviously. I mean, what's going on? And it was from Chicago. Uh, it was Greenview Observatory in Chicago. And they, and the people who did the imaging is from the, around 1920 to around 1945 ish. They did some cool stuff. Like this is a, I hope you can see my pointer. This is Comet Finster. Don't ask me the year. But I had this glass negative of it, and there was a note tucked into it that said, we computed where it should be and what how it wouldn't be moving, but we couldn't see it through the guide eyepiece, so we just did it blind. And they ended up with this, this image. I mean, you can see that the guiding isn't perfect. You, you see the sinusoidal um, uh, sinusoidal uh, star images and all, but that's pretty da darn good for when you couldn't even see the bloody thing. Um, but really impressive stuff. Um, this is a picture of the observatory. Uh, it was it's a, it was on top of an apartment building in Chicago. It's still there. It's been condoized, and the dome is now part of a condo. Um, so after asking everybody I knew in the Anti Telescope Society and elsewhere, um, you know who knew anything about the scope, finally somebody fessed up that they knew where it was. And I, I was able to reach out to the owner, who's a, a 
Again, nice guy, salt of the earth from Missouri. He bought it at a, a local auction. Apparently, one of the owners moved to Missouri and took it with him. And I ended up getting the whole kit and caboodle, everything except the pier. Wow, that's um, beautiful. Yeah. Um, okay, here's one of the two OTAs. Uh, the second one, um, eyepiece box. There's a filer micrometer that comes with it, Herschel wedge, everything but uh, everything but the um, the pier. And I had a local uh, steel company make me a pier that would match it. I have that. You know, it's a matter of taking the time to do some sanding and repainting and get it all together, and then figure out where I'm going to put it. So I've been kind. Of, oh, and this up here is a um, wide field plate camera that uh, a number of the images I have from them came out of. So, and this didn't cost all that much either. Um, an interesting vignette. So I, I flew to Missouri, went to this guy's house. We made a crate, put all the mechanics in it to, and had it shipped home. And I took all the glass, the eyepieces, the objectives, all that. And I put them in my carry on luggage. So I'm in, I don't even know, East, <laughs> you know, I don't want to say anything too rude. Uh, um, East Oshkosh, Missouri, tiny little airport. And I'm running the running my uh, bag through through the X-ray machine, thinking, what's this guy going to say? And he runs through the machine. He looks at me and he goes, are those antique telescope lenses? <laughs> Honest to God. I was like, I was shocked. <laughs> and it turns out we had a long chat because there was nobody at that airport. This guy is a collector of eight track tape decks wow. who knew the people collected eight track tape decks yeah, why would you collect those <laughs> and i learned and i'll pass on to all, all of your many viewers the first the eight track tape deck was invented by a guy named lear the same guy who did lear jets and apparently a lear branded eight track tape deck is worth Real money to some people. I don't know how many people, but <laughs> to some people out there. <laughs> but that was that was an interesting trip. So this is my uh, my garden telescope that I'm looking at. Yes. Um, had the uh, opportunity to send that to the um, Science Museum in London for two years for an exhibit that they did. I uh, was very glad when it came back. Um, frankly, I'll be perfectly honest, they didn't want to send it back. And um, it took some convincing. Okay, so this is this is a, a Porter drawing I have. Again, should look familiar. Um, right. And it's tough to see it, but down underneath is it's the, the the final printing plate that was used to print the books. And that's a drawing of somebody looking through a, a Springfield mount, which was uh, a mount made so you could be seated for the entire time at the same spot. The eyepiece didn't move. Everything yeah. else moved. Yeah, the only downside I can tell that mount is this counterweight hanging off the end there. That's like that's an accident waiting to happen. Yes, it is. And we have a couple other Porter paintings. Uh, interestingly enough, this one on the left, it's titled A Garden Telescope. And it was made in 1919, which is about seven years, I guess, before it came out with um, the real final product, Garden Telescopes. And, and the idea was a permanently mounted mainly made of concrete, it looks like, telescope. Um, I was unaware of such a thing. Bert was unaware of such, such a thing was devised or thought of at some point. One That's interesting thing in this drawing is that, and it's you can't really see it on this, this scale, but down at the bottom, there's a cutaway of the optics, of the optical train. So it was almost like Porter, you know, Porter did the Mount Palomar drawings with the cutaway stuff. Yeah. Well, this shows the outside and then kind of in the same image, the inside as well. So it was maybe an early, you know, early uh, version or, or thought of him doing that kind of stuff. Um, when Porter and his wife were out in California in the 30s and 40s, they would take camping trips uh, out into the desert, various places. And Porter was a watercolor artist. And I ended up finding a watercolor of Mesa Verde that he did. And strangely enough, this one was in Concord, New Hampshire, about 35 miles from my house. The woman had no idea who Porter was and all, but her whole house was decorated in paintings from the Southwest. So I guess the rest of what I was going to talk about is a little bit about variable star imaging and AVSO. 
And I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, uh, Wayne, but you know, if, if you're already doing astrophotography, you know, why not expand kind of the scope of what you're doing a little bit and do some scientific imaging? If you've got a, a, a CMOS or CCD camera, you've got and um, the proper lenses or telescope, you can you can be doing variable star observing and reporting images. And I've seen some people use successfully use cell phones, just naked raw cell phones, to do variable star imaging. It's not God's gift to precision, but it beats zero, right? And it's really useful for like in school projects high school or early college. This field is um, M42. I think it says that, yep, M42. It's a big stellar nursery, chock full of variables. Anytime you take an image of the Orion Nebula, you're, you, you've got to be imaging 50 to 100 variable stars. You know, the question is, what do you do with them? Just make the pretty picture or take that image, do some analysis and report on those stars. Um, one way to get into this is that AAVSO sends out alerts to two or three times a month, which are basically professionals asking amateurs for help observing targets. A lot of them are in conjunction with Hubble, um, JWST, or other space-based observations. So somebody's going to observe some particular couple stars with Hubble. They want to know how they look as the run-up to their observing time and af right after their observing time. So AVSO puts out an alert. They we're looking for images of these stars, um, and it helps these astronomers from these universities. It's kind of cool. Um, they can be found on the AVSO forums. Uh, don't have to be a member to go into the forums. Um, one of the cool things about working doing this, some of this variable star observing, you know, for professionals. So when I first started, I I started by um, requesting images because of some of these alerts that came out. Well, I started observing this one star for about two months. And out of nowhere, I get this email from a professor at Leiden University in Belgium, thanking me for observing his target, which is kind of cool, you know? And, you know, how, it, how it's helping him. And then one thing to led to another, we went back and forth a little bit and he goes, oh yeah, and I could use some help with this star, this star, and this star as well. I just don't have the time to do all the monitoring. So I've been I've been observing three or four stars now for for this guy in uh, in Belgium. Kind of the whole purpose of AAVSO, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Now again, one of the things we have at AAVSO is AAVSO Net, uh, I've, or as I say, it, cheek and uh, was it tongue in cheek, you too can take photometric images with telescopes worldwide with apertures up to twenty four inches without spending a fortune. So we, we, we've got a, a number of remote uh, access telescopes. Uh, we collect photometric images for AVSO members. Other than membership in the organization, there's no other charge. It's not like, you know, $100 per hour at high telescope or something like that. Run by AVSO volunteers. We do about, this, the network does about 15,000 images per month across the network. Um, and we've got scopes, uh, both large and small telescopes, in northern and southern hemisphere for full sky access. So if you want to do image something down near the South Pole, uh, you know, or we can do that. And there's an established kind of, you know, way one of the things I hear you fetch about periodically is processing, image processing in all the different ways. We've got basically an automatic pipeline to produce calibrated images, you know, because we're not looking for to bring up nebulosity in this app. All we're looking for is a really good signal to noise ratio across a, uh, a flat fielded image. The pretty pictures aren't what you're after. Right. Although I've, 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 I actually, one of my targets is in the Pleiades and I get about a third of the Pleiades, the area of the Pleiades in my image. I, I've been toying with the idea of finding two other variables so I could do the whole Pleiades and then stack them all. <laughs> but I think somebody might get angry at me for that one. Um, like I said, the cost is zip. Uh, just AABSO membership, no hourly fee. So um, I'm doing I'm doing about 80 hours. I, back in the envelope calculation, I do about 80 hours of observation through AABSO net scopes per year, which gives me a cost of one hour per 
$1 per observing hour, which is less than I pay for just for my own telescope in the backyard. You know, just for minor upkeep. So it's very inexpensive. There's fundamentally two system types. Um, what we call bright star monitors, which are Takahashi Epsilon 180 astrographs, which are, as, as you, I'm sure you know, top of the line wide field astrographs. Yeah, yeah they're amazing. Yeah, with an ASI 183 cameras. And we do photometry down to about 15th magnitude. Um, 60 by 90 minute fields of views, nice. And we got again, both North and Southern hemispheres. Because we've got several in the Northern hemisphere, I even have the have had the opportunities to get do like multiple images per star on a given evening. You know, one set of images from our New Hampshire system and one from a New Mexico system, you know, a few hours later. So um, we also have what we call faint star monitors, which are either 20 or 24 inch systems. And they're good for at least 19th magnitude, uh, but with obviously small field of views and both northern and southern hemisphere again. Uh, I'm not going to go through these. This is just a list of the bright star monitors and where they are. Um, if anybody's interested, I'd be happy to send this presentation out. This is a list of our faint star monitors. Um, the telescope I review images from is the Madrona Peak Observatory in Texas which is uh, an Arcos uh, 600, uh, you know, 61 centimeter Richie Cretien. Uh, beautiful, beautiful scope. This is one of our um, bright star monitors on a pair. They're all on paramounts. Uh, Gary Walker from uh, now of New Hampshire uh, actually kind of designed the pop off enclosure for these things. And this is MPO 61 down in Texas. Um, Nice system. I wish I could afford that. <laughs> so using AVSO, that's extremely simple. You just become an AVSO member. There's a proposal. We have an online proposal that you fill in. It takes um, the first one took me about a half an hour. Now I can do them in about ten minutes. Uh, the proposal is sent to the telescope allocation committee. When approved, times allocated on appropriate telescopes. Like they're, they're, we're not going to allocate one of the faint star monitors for six magnitude star. You know, you're not going to waste a you know 20 inch telescope on that. So, so somebody you know does real allocation. Who decides uh, uh, what projects are going to be accepted? Um, there's a group of three people who do the review, and from what I've been able to glean, uh, basically, if if no one's observing a star and you have a coherent reason about why you want to observe it have at it. Uh, one thing we tend not to do, but they've done a few times are like exoplanets, because that takes one telescope for like four to six hours of time. Whereas um, typically like one of the, one of the runs on my stars takes 10 minutes or less. Um, but if there's something really unusual and interesting that they have done a couple exoplanets and, and we're looking at more into that in the future. If there's an alert that comes out from one of these professionals, like I said, we're looking for coverage of some particular star for some study they're doing. If that's not being covered already on AVSO, not put a proposal in and you get the time on the telescopes to, to, to do the observing. If you have some other kind of star that you're just interested in, again, if, as long as they're not duplicating, you know, uh, efforts, then you get the time. You get a lot of... Uh... PhD candidates and things like that that, that put in requests? Some do. There's a few, at least a few that do. Um, we've also had requests from junior college um, professors and I think some high school uh, uh, science teachers. So images are taken, cal uh, the, the calibrated results are sent to you. Um, these are all FITS images. Um, you can't compress images, JPEGs just don't cut it. Um, you get an email that says your data is available. User, the, the user chooses how to analyze the calibrated data. You can use either AVSO online tools or your own and submit results. No, there's no hands-on. Everything's done robotically. You get, you get data in the morning or afternoon after it's they're taken. Kind of cheating in a way. Uh, this just shows that same data flow, which is, it's, in, you know, there's proposals uh, approved. It goes through either bright star or faint star monitor. Images taken goes through the 
pipeline, calibration pipeline, and either ends up uh, being accessible via anonymous FTP, or there's there's an application online on the AVSO site called VFOT uh, that you can have images downloaded to and it's used to analyze images. Um, there's a lot of different types of projects. You know, there's what people call legacy targets. Like there's a list of variables that have been observed for a hundred plus years. Uh, and they can still, you know, we some of them have been observed for the last few years. They can use more time on uh, campaigns to support researchers. Um, unusual types of com uh, or common variables, transient objects, NOVA, a lot of NOVA imaging. Uh, exoplanets occasionally, I think we're, it's an opinion. I think we're going to get in more into that later, but um, as time goes by, but, or just whatever your favorite project is. Um, I, I've got a number of projects. Um, I guess my favorite, if I can say that, is V1117 Hercules, of course. It's everyone's favorite. No, it isn't. <laughs> it, it's what's called a, a an Uxor variable, um, named after the first variable star of this type discovered, UX Orionis. And it's basically, it's it's a star with, with a, a, a rotating or gas and dust cloud obscuring it partly and it causes variability um i'm observing other couple other stars like that for me i have no interest in observing like a, a eclipsing binary that's like predictable you know as long as physics works there'll be an eclipse you know next week at this time um there's a couple um there's an active galactic nucleus called nsv 6690 that a group of Chinese researchers think, believe, they've published that it might collapse. Um, uh, it, it, the, the two binary black holes that make it up might collapse soon. Uh, and they've asked for observations of that. That seems like a reason. And by soon, they think within 300 days. Wow. Now, are they right? Who knows? But, it, you know, we've got the network. Let's just monitor as we can. And is that the... the catalog number for the galaxy yes okay so it's a pretty faint galaxy um about 15th magnitude yeah uh it's right next to about a 12th magnitude galaxy so yeah. well it, um i'm doing f i think five minute exposures in blue red or blue green red and infrared um on the faint uh bright star monitors um Somebody was interest, had interest in BU Taurus, which is a play on. Uh, I've been observing that pretty regularly. And again, there's a, a ton of other variables in the same field. So I'm providing data on 21 other Pleiades variables as well. One of the problems in the Pleiades is we to do photometry, you compare basically the brightness of your variable star to brightness of fixed stars in the same field. There aren't a lot of fixed stars in the Pleiades. I've got three. I've got a three in a one by one and a half degree field. That's it. So this is uh, this is actually old. I haven't. I have a couple more to add to this. These are some variables I'm reporting on. And another way to look at it is how often are, have these been looked at? So these are my accepted proposals to look at these stars. Along with them, I'm getting all of these other stars to report and the ones that are in green haven't haven't had anybody report on them for at least five years so i'm the only person f following them i think that's a reasonable reason to do that yeah okay here's my favorite v1117 so looking so these are years across here and this starts at around 2004 it goes to 2019 so from 2004 through 2018 ish this star faded by two to three magnitudes once every roughly 400 days and it, and, and it was rough it's not exact okay but then as we come into more modern times 18 19 something weird's been going on i've been observing it through that period so taking a closer look just from 2018 through 20 20, or actually 2019 to 2021, we have fades now where the star will go from being its brightest down to its faintest in a week. 
And the, the, the time periods between, you know, the peak to peak, faint to faint, uh, is between has been between a week and 21 days. So something's clearly going on with this gas cloud, and I don't know what. Um, the reason we have multiple colored dots there is this just shows you what colors I'm imaging it in. Uh, or, and these aren't just my images. Other There's a couple other folks using their home telescopes images. The blue dots are imaged in blue, green in green, red in red, and um, purplish is um, infrared, near-infrared observations. So it's kind of going nuts, and we don't know why yet. Um, and we're just coming out. So there was a time here where there was no observations. That's because it was too close to the sun. We're uh, Over the last week, I've had two sets of observations come into me. But, there, but it's pretty sparse yet for this year. We're just coming out from beyond the sun, behind the sun. So we'll see what happens this year. And, and that's really all I really wanted to present tonight. Um, that's really, really cool. So it's amateurs for the most part. I mean, obviously you're collaborating with professionals, but a lot of amateurs are doing this. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you're saying you don't need special equipment. So, uh, you know, I could take my doublet refractor and and uh, a color CMOS camera and go at it. Yes, sir. You can. And I'll tell you um, one of the an odd thing that most people don't consider until you get into it. We don't even want it dead on focus, Wayne. We'd rather have the stars kind of bloated out over across four to four to six six or so pixels. If a star is focused on one pixel and one pixel alone, well, what if the next image is on the next pixel? Those pixels aren't identical. Right. If you sit there, if you smear them over, you know, four or five pixels wide, so it's like a total of like 20 pixels, think of a circle, in a circle, um, you, you just, um, you, you're just getting a better average. You know, uh, the processing is much easier than the rigmarole you go through for, for those beautiful images you take. Thank you for that. But uh, it, it's the workflow on what I do is not really that time consuming. It's just the, the time consuming part is all the little fiddling that you do to get it just right. I'll never have you with, a, with an image that I take. But sure. um, it, is it better? I'm assuming that monochrome images are are going to give you more accuracy, certainly going to give you more sensitivity. Monochrome. Um, with filters. With filters, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, it's an interesting subject, actually. Um, so one of the, the things we're going through, um, you know, AVSO and actually in the whole astronomy hobby, if you will, is we have, um, so AVSO has got a, uh, got a, a, a library of images over 111 years. Okay. For the most part, up until like in the last decade, well, actually up until like two decades ago, they were primarily visual, which means, which means um, the precision isn't really good. You're estimating this, the brightness of a star in comparison to two other stars using your eye. And you're, you're probably not good to better than a tenth of a magnitude, okay? Um, where spacecraft are measuring to the thousand. Okay, big difference. So once we get into CMOS and CCD imaging, um, we can, and as long as you're on the non-saturated section of the exposure curve, right? We, you know, you can get down to 0 0.01 or 0.02 magnitude. Um, and in the 50s, 1950s, a few professor types, researchers, came up with what they called like standard filters. And they're, they're not the same standard we use for normal astrophotography. The blue filter has a different profile. The green has a little different profile. Um, and one key thing is they all, uh, none of the standard filters have any infrared 
transmission. If I took many of the photographic filters we use today, there's a there's a bump in the infrared. Mm -hmm. So you, you're taking a picture of a red star, but you have a blue filter. So it ought to be really faint, but it's a little brighter than it should be because that filter is letting through a little infrared. So there's, you know, we're trying to figure out how to uh, get around those things. Like you might, you know, put an, an infrared blocking filter in the path and just leave it there. You know, and only only do your scientific imaging in blue, green, and red. Um, but yeah, but but those kind of um, as long as we know what filters are, what kind of filters they were, they're very useful. Yeah, uh, again, uh, the the bare filters in a DSLR are fine as long as they're reported out as the bare, basically bare filters in DSLR. So they're not comparing to different filter set. Okay. So, so really, that to to participate in this, I wouldn't even have to use those visual filters. I could just yeah. use an IR blocking filter, and I'm good to go. Yeah, absolutely. And a, a DSLR or or a color CMOS camera. But I'm assuming with a DSLR, you don't want one that's been modified. Uh, you know, they they oh. modify them for hydrogen alpha sensitivity. I mean. I think you could as long, you know, you're going to have to go backwards. You're going to have to put an, an infrared blocking filter in. Right. You know, seeing out through hydrogen alpha is okay, but seeing out to a micron wavelength isn't okay. So, but that's a, it's a good point. So, so what, what's the AAVSO looking to do? Are they looking to uh, get more people involved in doing this? Like to get more people involved, like to get more telescopes on the sky. Um, we're, uh, we're, we, over the last few years, we've been kind of broadening the mission a little bit. Um, so like NASA has a database of, uh, exoplanet transits. AAVSO actually owns that database. NASA is using our, our database. Wow. And so all, anything you submit to NASA ends up in AAVSO. So we're starting to, you know, branch out into exoplanets. Um, there's a number of people starting to branch out into spectroscopy. Uh, we've, we, we're, uh, we have a spe uh, spectroscopic observation database that's been formed. And I don't think there's, I don't think there's more than 10,000 images in it total. Um, but it's, it's just really getting going. Wow. So as a, a director uh, of the AAVSO or a board member of the AAVSO, uh, what, what message do you want to put out there? Uh, we're we're out there to give uh, amateur astronomers more of a I'll call it a raison d'être reason for being uh, in the scientific world. You want to do you know help the science, scientific world out? We can help you get there. We got mentors uh, um, to help you to help out to help uh, help you get going. Uh, we've got uh, tools, both software and hardware, to get you going. You know if you want to image that. 19th magnitude variable star, and you can't do it in your three inch refractor, that's okay. You can use ours. Um, um, and it's useful work. Uh, I think it's kind of cool work. It seems like a, a great resource for astronomy clubs uh, yeah. to really get involved in, in doing some real research. Um, the, the local club that, that I belong to here in New Jersey, um, we had a couple of members, actually, I think three uh, that I know of offhand that actually got uh, projects approved and they had their observations done with the Hubble. That's it cool. Was back in the 90s, they, they were taking, you know, amateur proposals. And uh, in fact, you know, uh, one of them was a regular attendee of himself, and it's Jim Flood. Uh, and Jim had a proposal. That, that went through with, and there was two other uh, guys that I know of that had one uh, accepted and had their observations and and they did, you know, pr produced uh, data. I don't know that there was ever a conclusion made. I know one of them was trying to actually disprove the Hubble constant, but I don't think that actually worked out. Yeah, I would guess not. <laughs> so yeah, actually, I, I think that's, that's kind of a failing by the professionals. Um, originally, I don't. I don't have the exact number, Wayne. But the, the guy who ran the Space Telescope Science Institute 
um, allocated something like 0.1% or 0.01% of observing time to anybody. You didn't have to be affiliated with the university yet, but you had to put together a quality proposal. And I think that's very appropriate. And then he was replaced. He resigned, you know, he ended up leaving. And the next person who went in said, well, why, why shouldn't they have, be all university people? I mean, it's so artificially narrowing. You know, and it wasn't like, it wasn't even a, a percent of the observing time being allocated. It was, you know, it was a tenth or a hundredth of a percent of observing time. It was almost nothing, right? But it, but it encouraged um, the public uh, to interact and, you know, take observations and, and get in the press for your observations. Um, it just strikes me as being a really small cost and for a lot of gain. That's, it's all very important. And, uh, you know, every little observation helps, especially with, with something like variable stars. And, and oh, by the way, uh, a majority of the stars are variable in one way or another. Correct. You know, some of them are just like our sun, though, where the sunspots uh, make it variable. You know, as you rotate around, you got different area of the sun being, you know, blocked. But, um, but we, can, we can measure stars that way. And some are known, to, you know, a lot of them are known to be, oh, yeah, there's your sun, sunspot stars. That's but fantastic. then there's other cool stuff going on. Uh, you know, you got one star, you know, um, ripping gas away from another star and then occasionally get bright spots where they cause fusion. And then you've got these weird Oxor stars that I'm interested in that uh, have some kind of cloud around them. Uh, that's a variable density, you know, variable attenuation. I Fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's something that I've I've often thought about wanting to do. Although I've I've been devoting my uh, telescope time to to just pure imaging, mm -hmm. uh, I want to, you know, I, I'm kind of striving to, you know, get better at it because it's, it's there's a pretty steep learning curve, and uh, you know I'm having a lot of fun doing it, but after a few years, I think I'm going to want to. Uh, do something where I'm actually giving back. And and this is a great way to do it, where you can, you know, image things, uh, you know, still use your equipment, still get images, but but you're doing something useful with them. And, and I don't have to get, you know, 10 hours of data right. on, on something to have useful uh, information. And the, I think one of the great things is that you can do this from pretty much anywhere. You don't have to be oh, yeah. out in the middle of nowhere. You can be... Uh, in a, uh, you know, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to be in, in the middle of New York City, but you probably could. You could be in a pretty light polluted sky. And you could do this kind of stuff when, the, when you got a big moon, as long as you're not looking towards it, you know? Right. right. Um, so, yeah, very easy. The, the only other thing I would point people towards, although I've gotten away from it in recent years, is um, outreach. Outreach to kids, get kids involved. Uh, I used I used to love hosting star parties for my local elementary school. Uh, we did it once a year. Um, my town had exactly one working farm in it, and and the people who owned the farm let us use the farm for for uh, star parties. So we get if you include parents, we get like three hundred kids and parents out to the farm, and the the, the guys who owned the farm loved it because it got people into their farm stand and got visibility, but they were just the nicest people. Uh, they do a bonfire every year. They do hay rides out through the fields after dark. And I get, I was able to get typically 10 or more telescopes from ATMOB and the North shore astronomy club and a couple others in the area to show up. So, um, do you want to just we, explain ATMOB? Not everyone is familiar with that. Oh, app. sorry. Uh, Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, which is a misnomer. Um, way, way back, like in, uh, Ken Lani, correct me on this, but like in the 20s, there were two astronomy clubs in Boston. One was the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, which actually made telescopes. And there was another group called the Bond Astronomical Society, which were observers. Well, you know, at the end of the day, there were, I think there were the same sets of people. And people said, well, why don't we just make one club, you know? And they ended up with the ATMOB name. Although I'd say probably more than half the club is not 
you know, polished glass. Um, it's kind of a really nice club. We're one of the oldest in the country, 300-something uh, odd members. And I do mean odd members. <laughs> and um, we have, a, we have a, a, a farmhouse that we rent or lease, I should say, in Westford, Mass., which is kind of in the suburbs, uh, where we've got at least four observatories now. Like, number keeps going up. And uh, a metal shop and an optic shop, uh, an electronic shop, um, an observing field. That's it's funny. a beauteous thing. We, I believe we, I believe we lease it for a buck a year from MIT. It's on the grounds of Haystack Radio Observatory. And years and years ago, somebody in our club learned that they were MIT was going to donate it to the Westford Fire Department to practice putting fires out in. <laughs> and but MIT was willing to call that off and lease it to us instead. We we've been there since the eighties. That's that's fantastic. But yeah. Uh, so Peter, I want to thank you uh, for your time and. Uh, it's always a pleasure whenever we get together. You know, like I said, we go back a long way, and uh, you're a very interesting person. Uh, and and you've got, I mean, besides the AAVSO and, and the observing, but the stuff with the empty telescopes, everything else, you've got, uh, you're really, uh, you know, reaching toward the pinnacle of the, the amateur side of this hobby. And it's just fantastic. So, again, I want to thank you. Uh, for your time, and it was a pleasure to have you on. Wayne, it's, it's always fun talking to you, and I, I just wish we could see you more than once a year. Thank you for sharing our time in learning about the AAVSO and all the uh, different parts of amateur astronomy that uh, Peter is involved in. He really is a terrific person, and it was an honor for me to have him on here, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Again, I apologize about the quality of my audio on this episode. Uh, my microphone cable uh, was, was cut, and I didn't realize it until it was too late. Um, but I do have a new cable, and everything sounds, uh, in my opinion, I think it sounds a lot better now. I hope you enjoy it as well. So, that's all for this episode. I want to thank you for tuning in. I hope you found our time together to be fun and helpful. As always, if you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail message at 973-404-0380. I always make sure to answer those. Uh, if you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. Uh, there's a lot going on there. You'll find other members, uh, videos, blogs, and lots of useful information there for your enjoyment. And I really strongly urge you to visit our YouTube channel, the Astro Guy Podcast. Uh, you can go there. You can watch past episodes. Every now and then, another video sneaks in. Uh, recently, I posted a time lapse of Comet ZTF, and I've posted some other things there as well, so that's kind of fun. Uh, and if you could subscribe to that, that would be such a help. Even just go in, like a video, comment. It really does help us in the algorithm, and it helps us get out there to more people. Uh, so please also consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform. That can help us get new listeners as well. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.